On the night of November 6th, a man emerged from a forested area in rural southeast Ohio. He had went to a farmhouse, knocked on a door, and asked for help. When our sheriff arrived at the scene, Scott Davis tells a story of what had happened to him. He had met with these people and that they had uh, shot him and then chased him for hours through the woods until he could escape under the cover of dark. I had been in uh, South Carolina for about 15 years. At the time, my mom said she could use a little bit of help up here in Ohio. So I started asking people in Ohio if they knew of any work. And I just wanted to have something to do. People kept saying, man, get on Craigslist. There's all kinds of jobs. So I got on there, started looking, and I just happened to come across a job there that said take care of 688 acres in southern Ohio, $300 a week, furnished trailer, utilities paid. I said, well, that sounds pretty good. So I responded to the Craigslist ad, and I started emailing back and forth with this person called Jack. Finally, we started making telephone conversations. We were talking about motorcycles, and I told him that I had a Dyna Lowrider, a nice bike. He said that there would be a place for me to park it in the barn. She said, just bring whatever electronics you'll need, such as a TV, your stereo. He wanted to make sure it was clear that it was just going to be me. And I decided to go ahead and make the move up to Ohio. In the morning of November 6th, I believe I ended up getting there probably around 8 o'clock in the morning. I met Jack and a young guy at Shoney's. He said this was his nephew. He said, uh, so let's go in and get something to eat. After breakfast, the men climb into Jack's white Buick to take a look at the farm that Scott will manage. We're heading out towards the farm. I'm, I'm paying attention. We started on a nice two-lane country road. It was paved. And then we made another turn, and then the road got smaller. We continued driving down this country road, and there was no cell phone service right there, no bars. He looks over at his nephew, and Jack says, remember where I got that deer last week? He says, I want you to pull off the side of the road. So me and Jack both get out of the car. We start walking down these trails. And the farther back we got, the less trail it was. And now it's getting to where there's not really a path anymore. It wasn't a second later I heard click. I knew that sound. The gun just misfired. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I spun around. I put my elbow up. That's when he hit me in the elbow. That's when he shot me. And I looked at him. I said, what the are you doing? And I looked at his eyes, and his eyes were pitch black, like shark eyes. There was nothing in this man's eyes, nothing. Scott runs for his life as Jack continues firing in his direction. I thought I heard five at that point. Then I figured one misfire. So I figured he'd already went ahead and shot all the bullets he had. As I was running away, my hat fell off, and I just kept running and falling and running and falling. Scott stays hidden for hours. When darkness finally comes, he runs several miles down the road until he finds a house. So I went and knocked on these people's door, and then they called the sheriff for me and the ambulance. On the morning of November 7th, I began my investigation Scott had met with these new employers uh, the morning of the shooting. I was able to request the surveillance videos from the restaurant. I viewed the uh, video. I could clearly see Scott Davis in the lobby of the uh, restaurant, and he was with an older, kind of bigger guy, and I could see a younger person that was with them. Investigators think they might know the older man in the video. We had recently been involved with a uh, case of U.S. Marshals on a manhunt for a fugitive. He had been in and out of jail and prison most of his life. And after I looked at the surveillance video, same size, same build, we thought there was a good chance that the person masquerading as Jack was, in fact, that fugitive, Richard Beasley. Richard Beasley is a career criminal on the run. Authorities in multiple states have been trying to track him down for months. Richard Beasley is from the state of Ohio. He was in prison in Texas for some gun-related charges and some burglary. He came back to Ohio and fled parole. He ends up back in a life of crime involving thefts and drugs and prostitution. I got a call from Deb Bruce. She had read the newspaper article about the shooting of Scott Davis. And then Deb provided us with some uh, information 
that her brother, David Polly had uh, very similar, almost identical details of applying for a job on Craigslist on a cattle farm, uh, which she believed would be in Noble County. Deb told us that this had happened around October 22nd, 23rd, and nobody had heard from David since. That was approximately two weeks before Scott Davis's incident. So we were pretty confident at that time that there could be a, a potential another victim. I was able to get some cadaver dogs, and we were able to find an area of interest that one of the dogs actually indicated on. It was a very wet area, and as the dog was digging, blood began bubbling up from the ground into the water on the surface. We excavated the area. We found a, a white male who had been buried very shallow, maybe 12 or 18 inches deep, face down. He had a injury to the back of his head, which was consistent with, we believe, the gunshot wound. And we located a bracelet. I took it, and I made a phone call to Deb Bruce. Deborah Bruce, his sister, she knew instantly that that was something that he wore all the time, and he never took it off. So it gave us pretty much point positive that that was David Pauly in that shallow grave. While investigators continue to comb the woods for any additional evidence, the family of 56-year-old Ralph Geiger has worries of their own. He was living in Akron, Ohio. He was homeless. And then he saw an ad for being a caretaker on a farm, called the number, and went to Southern Ohio to interview and hopefully get the job. Ralph took the job in August of 2011. But by November of 2011, nobody in the family had heard from Ralph for an extended period of time. On uh, November 15th, we were able to locate Richard Beasley's wife and his daughter. When shown the Shoney's surveillance uh, video, they immediately picked out uh, Richard Beasley was the larger man in the video. And then they said, we can also identify that young man. And his name is Brogan Rafferty. Brogan and Richard are friends. They go to church together. And she advised that Brogan Rafferty was approximately 16 to 17 years old. 10 days after the shooting of Scott Davis, and one day after discovering David Pauly's body, authorities on the hunt for Richard Beasley track his phone call to an address in Akron, Ohio. I called the SWAT team and sent him to that location. And Detective Mackey and I were at breakneck speed going to Akron. At the same time, they located Mr. Beasley as he was walking and they were able to uh, take him down. We arrived just after Richard Beasley had been put in handcuffs on the street. Now, this is the first time I've seen Richard, and I'm face to face with this killer. Right in the middle of this whole thing, we get another phone call from a woman identifying herself as Mrs. Kern. Tina Kern is the ex-wife of 47-year-old Tim Kern, a father of three living outside of Akron, Ohio. Mrs. Kern reports to us that he was missing when she had last contact with him on November 12th. She told us that he responded to this ad on Craigslist for a job. That was very concerning to us. Timothy Kern went missing around November the 12th, and Scott Davis got shot on November 6th. It is extremely disheartening to think as you're trying to find these suspects and arrest them, they possibly could have had another victim. We now realize we have four men with similar backgrounds who answered what we believe is the same ad for a job on a farm. 16-year-old Brogan Rafferty is finally coming clean about his role in a string of murders he is suspected of carrying out with 52-year-old Richard Beasley. Brogan tells us during that interview that Richard Beasley doesn't own any property in Noble County. There was never a farm. They had made contact with Ralph Geiger and offered him this job, which Ralph ultimately said he would take. When Ralph arrived for his first day of work, Beasley and Rafferty took him into the woods where they said the farm was located. When I turned around, Mr. Geiger was in front of Mr. Beasley and uh, Mr. Beasley pulled a pistol out, and with both hands, he pointed at the back of Mr. Geiger's head. And uh, I saw that 
And I closed my eyes and then I heard a uh, gunshot. I opened up Mr. Guy who was sitting in the creek bed. All right, did he seem to be dead? Yes, he was dead. What we learned from Brogan about the murder of David Pauly is this is going to be a source of income for Richard Beasley. Brogan said that they lured David Pauly so that they could steal his possessions, steal everything he had. It was part of their plan that these people that they picked would come here with all their stuff, and then after they killed them, they sell it. So David Pauly died simply for the contents of his U-Haul van. When it came to Scott Davis, I learned that the motivation was a motorcycle that was a different piece of equipment and tools. He thought that he could get a lot of money for it. How much money do you think it was worth, Beasley? He thought it would be worth maybe $30,000. This would have been a big payday for Richard Beasley and Brogan Rafferty. When Scott survived, they had to keep going. He just needs a little bit more money to get through the winter. And now we have Tim Kern. He told us about picking Tim up, and Tim was all excited. He got the job. They were taking him to the location. And Richard is asking him, how much money do you have on you? And Tim was really down on his luck. He basically had the, the clothes on his back and $5 in his pocket. But they ended up murdering Tim Kern later that morning. It almost didn't seem to be about the money anymore. Tim Kearns was the most senseless killing that I'd ever been involved in. In the months ahead, as the prosecution prepares for court, they decide to seek the death penalty for Richard Beasley. Rogan Rafferty will face trial first. A judge rules he can be tried as an adult. Rogan Rafferty is found guilty of murder, robbery, and kidnapping. He is sentenced to life in prison. Richard Beasley stands trial for the deaths of three men and the attempted murder of a fourth, Scott Davis. Richard Beasley is found guilty of 26 of 29 indicted counts. Three weeks later, he is sentenced to death.